All right, hello everyone. Um, I wanna say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about some essential pieces of web UI HTML controls. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the really exciting work that is finally being done to not only improve styling them, but also extending them um, and customizing them. So I have a lot of information to get through. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So my name is Stephanie and I'm a program manager for Microsoft Edge Developer Experiences. And I am fond of calling that my fancy title um, because underneath that program manager title, I'm a few different things. So I come from a background in design. Um, I have front end development skills and I am a developer and designer advocate for Microsoft Edge and the web as a whole. And so in my former life as a designer, who was also responsible for the development of the sites that I designed, I became all too aware of the issues with designing websites and using native form controls and having difficulty with styling them but also getting them to render the same across different browsers. And compared to what was rendering in the different browsers versus my pixel perfect mockups that I had shown clients, it often felt like this. It was, I'd show that pixel perfect mockup and then it would be slightly off in different ways in different browsers. And clients would frequently ask me, why do these things not look exactly like your mockup? And why doesn't Internet Explorer look exactly like Chrome? And at the time, I didn't understand the web platform or realize that the root of this issue was beyond me. And so I understand this pain point and relate deeply to it around styling controls and trying to get them to render um, across browsers the same. And so today I'm hoping to demystify some of these pain points for you all, as well as talk about what's to come to help relieve some of that pain, because there is a lot of really exciting work being done at the moment. So today we're going to be talking about the past, why HTML controls are the way they are, how we got to this spot, the present, we'll do a quick overview of where we're at now, with current controls, and then we're gonna talk about the future, what's to come with HTML controls and select specifically, because that is the first control we've sort of started to look at. And so to understand the current problems with controls, we need to review some history and we need to go a very long ways back to 1995. So 1995 is a whole uh, was a good year, in my opinion, for just pop culture and cultural culture in general. Um, it brought us a lot of good things. It brought us things like Xena Warrior Princess, which is one of my personal favorites. It brought us the Macarena. Starbucks Frappuccinos were introduced. Windows 95. And perhaps the most important thing in the history of the web, in my opinion, the first official HTML uh, specification, the HTML 2.0 standard. And so this specification is interesting because this was the first standard for HTML that was actually ratified and endorsed by the W3C. There was no official HTML 1.0 spec before this. There had been a draft that was circulating around in the early 90s, uh, but what it covered was extremely basic in terms of features, and uh, Tim Berners-Lee was circulating this at CERN and actually couldn't get anyone to review it. And so the draft for that ended up expiring in early 1994, and then was eventually replaced with the HTML 2.0 draft. And that incorporated what had been an HTML 1.0, but its sort of main focus was to document and standardize what was already out there in web browsers in terms of features without breaking functionality. 
I know this is the early 90s, so you might be thinking that that doesn't sound too bad to go and document all that. There can't have been that many browsers out there in 1994. However, there were actually quite a few. And so between 1991 and 1994, all these different web browsers popped up because a library of code that contained the building blocks for a web browser uh, was made available to developers. And so developers started building web browsers. And because HTML was so feature sparse, all of them started implementing their own HTML features to fill out the feature gaps. And so this rift in HTML continued to grow up until the HTML 2.0 spec. And so with HTML 2.0, that standardizes what's out there in the web and with it comes the standardization of form functionality. And this standardized a method for users to enter data into an HTML document and for that data to be used to perform an action such as logging into a website. And so this is key. It standardized the method only, not the form parts or how they were constructed. And so now we have some standardized HTML building blocks to build websites, but it's still 1995, early web days, and we're missing something. We're still lacking a standardized styling language. And so CSS wasn't supported by the HTML standard until HTML 3.20 in 1997. And it wasn't actually even until 1999 that browsers really embraced CSS and supported it with the 4.01 um, HTML specification. And so if we go back to 1995, we've got our first form controls, but we have no styling language to style them. So browsers had to rely on the operating system to render and style those form controls. And that led to a technical dependency on the operating system. And then later, even with early versions of CSS, there were parts of form controls that CSS just wasn't able to access. But the other side of this was that browser vendors were also extremely reluctant to make controls stylable because they were a reflection of the operating system's visual appearance. The idea that developers would want or need to make form controls look differently wasn't really a concept. And so when we finally accepted that developers did want to be able to change the appearance of controls, uh, they were then given the appearance property. Uh, but it, it only controlled system level styling. And of course, developers didn't use it for its intended use. Um, and it ended up not being implemented as it was designed and so it was implemented differently across browsers, which then led to many interoperability issues between the different browsers with lots of different vendor prefixes and so many other issues. Um, and the support for this sort of varied so widely across browsers. And back in the day, the browser with the most dominant market share, Internet Explorer, didn't even support it. So there were a lot of issues with the appearance property. And so to quickly recap um, all that history, pre-1995, lots of browsers pop up. In 1994, the HTML 1.0 draft expires. By 1995, we get our standardized HTML 2.0 spec. We've got basic HTML form controls, but we have no standard for styling. Um, and so it takes an operating system dependency to, to render and style those controls. And then by 1999, CSS is sort of embraced by browsers as the standardized styling language for the web. And so between 1999 and today, a lot has happened with the web. There were a few browser wars, um, form controls and functionality continued to be enhanced, standards and CSS evolve and are continuously evolving. And we even go on to add new form controls. And so 
with all this evolution, you would think that would leave us in a good spot right now. It's been 25 years. Uh, maybe we would have figured things out by now in regards to these components, but I wouldn't be here talking to you if we actually had. And so MDN Docs has some great documentation around form controls and their stylability that sort of assesses the current state of, of working with controls. And I've gone ahead and sort of bucketed them out into three categories. So currently uh, our first bucket of form controls, these can be styled with few problems and that's form, field set, label, output, text field, and buttons. Probably not gonna run into any issues with these. Please style to your heart's content. The second group, uh, these can be styled with more complex CSS and hacks. And th these are checkboxes, radios, and legend. Um, you'll probably be able to achieve the style you're going for. Again, it's probably gonna be a little bit more complex CSS or there may be some hacky tricks. And then this final bucket, I just lovingly refer to as the good night and good luck bucket. These are advanced native controls. These either can't be styled with CSS or they have extremely limited stylability because of how they rely on the platform for their architecture. And so of those original forms from the HTML 2.0 spec, we didn't really improve the ease of styling anything. We've only got two in each bucket. Um, so styling them to our current needs is still nowhere what present day devs need from their native controls. And even with the controls that we went on to add between 1999 and today, they all sort of went into the advanced native form control bucket that's almost impossible to style them. So it's not a good spot for developers at the moment. And one thing I want to note here too, is that the CSS specification called out that user agents were the ones responsible for styling controls and that browsers didn't even have to apply CSS to form controls, which then leads to browser inconsistencies. So on the one hand, I am a designer, my background's in design. These are different companies with different design languages it makes sense that some of these would look different. But when we're building or should be building to support things across multiple browsers, especially things that serve the same function and purpose, they should probably be consistent, at least their parts. And so like I mentioned previously, it was the method for entering data that was standardized, not the actual form parts. And so on top of poor CSS access um, to controls and then browser inconsistencies, we can't actually extend the functionality of a native control currently. I love this tweet from Scott Gell. You have one problem. You want icons in your select menu options. You decide to make a custom select menu. You now have at least 75 problems. And that sums things up perfectly because when you rebuild a control from scratch, instead of using a native control, you don't get all the good stuff that's already baked in like accessibility and security. So you not only have to build the control, you have to add all those things back in and then you have to test them. It is a time consuming and bad developer experience, but currently it's necessary when you can't extend your controls the way you need to. A good example of this is the video element where the developer either gets all of the controls or none of them by adding or removing the controls attribute. And so when we want our HTML controls to look like this or this, it's no wonder that developers have just reverted to rebuilding their controls from scratch. And so we decided to step back on the browser side and ask some questions to make sure that this was an area to go invest in. We knew this was a pain point, but were better native form controls something that developers really wanted? 
And the answer to that is overwhelmingly yes. Yes, developers do. <laughs> they are tired of rebuilding um, their form controls from scratch. And so my former colleague, Greg Whitworth, who is now at Salesforce, um, conducted a survey on form controls about a year and a half to two years ago uh, to really start to dive deep in this space of form controls. And so he sent out an initial survey on Twitter and that had nearly 1400 respondents. And these respondents were all in varying roles from full stack devs to designers. And they all had varying degrees of experience across web development. And Greg asked respondents if they had ever used a library or a framework or built controls from scratch. And if they did, which controls did they create? And these were the top 10 with select being the most recreated followed closely by checkbox and then date, radio, file, progress, button, dialogue, text area, and text. And then Greg asked why, why were folks recreating um, controls from scratch? And well over a third said it was because they couldn't change the appearance sufficiently. Another third just wanted to add functionality, so they wanted to extend their control. And just under a third said because of browser inconsistencies, which one might assume has to do with parents. So if we lump that into the first group um, who said they, it was because they couldn't change appearance, that's over two thirds of developers spending time recreating controls from scratch because of appearance. That is a lot of developer time. And so Greg followed up with an amended survey for uh, JSConf EU attendees, where he asked two additional questions in the survey, which form control gives you the most frustration and why? And select clearly stole the show here with nearly 50% of respondents saying select. And then he asked why? And these were some of the verbatims that he got. Select requires hacky tricks. Can't style option elements at all to the extent we need to. With the amount of work it takes to implement an accessible alternative with complete feature parity is massive. And I can just feel the pain sort of oozing from this answer. And so this sort of prompted me to ask my own question. I wanted to know how painful is it? And so I did my own research again using Twitter um, and I asked developers and front end designers to please fill in the blank. I would rather blank than attempt to style a native select element. And it turns out Every, most people deeply hate the select element. Like there are some painful things people would rather do in attempt to style a native select element. So I'm just gonna go over some of my favorite responses. I think I had 250 responses to this. So there was a lot to pick from. Um, so I would rather call each person attempting to use the form and ask them what option they would like. I would rather build the entire site in Flash. I would rather break dance barefoot on a pile of Legos. I'd rather chew on glass. And my continual favorite is, I would rather heat up a rusty old fork with a few tines snapped off and broken than with both arms thrust it into my inner thigh and attempt to style a native select menu. Clearly, Select is a massive pain point for developers. And so let's talk about the future and what's to come and what we're going to do to resolve some of that pain. So I am excited to say that the future is shiny and I am so excited um, about the work that is currently being done on the browser side and in standards groups. Um, I'm excited to say too that HTML isn't done. There is some 
awesome work on a new element that is that is being proposed at the moment that I'll go to in a minute. So that is very exciting. And on the browser side, like I said, we are doing some work um, with the current controls um, in the browser. And so the Edge team has been collaborating closely with Chrome. Um, we made updates to controls in the Chromium project that landed last year. So our initial focus was new styles and accessibility improvements um, with a, Edge's browser engine switched to Chromium over from Edge HTML, we wanted to bring over some of that good accessibility stuff that was in Edge HTML into Chromium. And so we did that. And then on top of that, we collaborated on a much needed visual refresh. And so the current controls here actually aren't current anymore. They are the old ones. Um, but if we wanted to lose those gradients and the shadows, and bring a much more neutral and universal style that we're hoping developers can leverage while the, we get the standards work started for more in-depth customizations. So hopefully this lessens the time spent recreating um, form controls just for a, an appearance sake. Uh, and so we're hoping this more neutral look solves that problem um, for developers temporarily. And so, like I mentioned, the HTML isn't done. We're also looking at new native components. And so in a previous version of this talk, I mentioned the Chrome team had taken on looking at toggle switch and virtual list. And I know they had some prototypes at the time, but in going to check on the status of these, it appears they've both been abandoned at the moment. However, this doesn't necessarily mean we won't get them someday. And as developers, if these are things you would like to see a native element for, please tell us on Twitter or if you have a blog post about what you want or engage with us in the open UI group, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and so if you signal that these are important things that you want to see native components for, um, let us know. We are listening. But it's not all bad news. Um, we are working on a new proposal for a new pop-up element. So this, this um, explainer for this pop-up element was just made public uh, at the end of January. And so this proposal sort of evolved as the team started to look at revamping select and identified a, a need for a universal pop-up element. So there are currently many use cases in which a developer might need to create a sort of transient uh, user interface that gets displayed on top of all the other web UI. These are things like action menus, form element suggestions, content pickers, and teaching UI. And so the goals of this pop-up element um, as outlined in the explainer are as follows. So we want the pop-up element to contain arbitrary content, can be fully styled, uh, including properties which require compositing with other layers of the host web application, can be sized and positioned to the author's discretion, which, um, are rendered on top of all other content in the host web application, include an appropriate user input management experience out of the box with flexibility to modify behaviors such as initial focus and are accessible by default with the ability to further extend semantics and behaviors as needed for the author's specific use case. And so there are other elements which are aesthetically similar to pop-ups but do not have this light dismiss behavior that um, we are basically using to define what a pop-up is. So uh, those other elements may be better addressed with the dialogue element um, or other new purpose built elements. And so an open pop-up will have light dismiss behavior, meaning that it will be automatically hidden when one of three things happens. Either the user hits the escape key, the layout of the pop-up or its anchor element is changed or focus moves outside of the pop-up and its anchor element if applicable. And so this term light dismiss is sort of new 
Um, the first time I heard about it was last month in one of our open UI groups. So a, a generalized definition of what light, light dismiss is, is currently being discussed in the open UI standards group. And some examples of elements that don't have light dismiss behavior are things like alerts, toasts, custom tooltips, and other persistent popover UI. So let's go ahead and take a look at a basic example for the pop-up element. So here we have a button element and our pop-up element. And to tie or anchor the button to the pop-up, we have our button ID menu uh, set to menu button. And we then use an anchor attribute and set that value to the button ID of menu button. And Currently, pop-up menus are not visible until show is called by the author. And so with this new pop-up element, um, we're proposing that the pop-up element should come with a with show and hide methods, but we are exploring uh, further scriptless invocation. So not needing any JavaScript for that. Um, optional attributes for focus management, such as autofocus and delegate focus, um, an optional anchor attribute, so that's again used to tie pop up to the activating element as shown in the basic example. And this will also be used in a to be published anchored positioning proposal, so there's more explainers to come. Um, and again, that light, light dismiss behavior. And so if you are interested in reading the full explainer where there are um, a lot more details and examples, please go to aka.ms backslash pop-up dash explainer um, and give that a read. If you have feedback, please open an issue on GitHub or be sure to tweet one of the explainer authors on Twitter. Um, they've been engaging with folks who have had feedback um, because it's an essential part of this explainer process. And now let's talk about the stuff that I'm probably the most excited about. Let's talk about fixing the current problems with styling um, and extending controls. And so last year, about August, I believe, August 2020 or so, an explainer with proposed solutions for how we want to approach enabling customization of controls UI was released by um, the Chrome Edge and OpenUI teams. And this proposal for form controls <clears throat> uses the MVC design pattern, where the form control is made up of three distinct parts, a model view and controller. Now, this is actually a pretty common pattern in the software design, uh, so I'm not going to go into that whole pattern. There is a lot of information out on the web if you're interested in exploring that further. And so these are the goals that the proposed solution explainer sort of set out to accomplish. So we want developers to be able to style any arbitrary part of a native control. We want them to be able to add arbitrary content into a control, style a particular part without having to rewrite the whole UI, uh, customize the UI without re-implementing the data model and code for reacting to user input. And most importantly, in my opinion, customized controls will be accessible by default. And so we're proposing three different solutions that offer a range of flexibility in customization depending on what the developer wants. And so I'm going to go ahead and just dive right into those three customization options. So our first solution is around standardized control UI anatomy, parts, and behavior. So earlier, I talked about the history of controls and how it was the method for entering data that was standardized and not the actual form control parts. So the root of our issue is that form controls and their parts aren't standardized. Um, and this means that they're not reachable by developers because different browser engines have chosen to um, build and render their form controls differently. 
And so OpenUI is the initiative under the YCG, which is the Web Incubator Community Group, to standardize form controls and components. The OpenUI team, which I would like to call out, is open to anyone who would like to participate, is focused on researching and documenting design systems and frameworks that are already out there today. Um, it's identifying patterns and naming and use cases and using those patterns to establish cow paths for standards and eventually browsers. And because select is the biggest pain point for developers, like I mentioned previously, um, it was the first form control that OpenUI started to research. And so if you're interested in the editor's draft proposal for select, um, that is available on the OpenUI website if you want to go check that out. Lots of interesting information there if you're into the very technical nitty gritty of, of how these things uh, are, how we're trying to define these things. Um, and so I definitely recommend going to check that out. And so when I talk about standardizing control and anatomy, I will use select here as an example of what that looks like. And so the anatomy of a select could be defined as consisting of one button part containing one selected value part and one pop-up list box, that pop-up proposal, uh, part containing zero to N option parts. And then we would go on to define the expected behavior of a select. So what happens when you click on it and, and so on. And so this standardized anatomy will allow the styling of native parts using pseudo classes and the part pseudo element. So a developer will be able to change the color of a selects button in an interoperable, interoperable manner without replacing any of the HTML. So in our, in our example here, we have our CSS class called styled select, and we're utilizing the part pseudo element to target the button to change the background color. And I wanna call out here too that, notice the HTML code here is just the code of a select today. So you wouldn't, again, have to rewrite any of the actual form control. We're just exposing the parts of a select on the platform side that, and then and enabling access for devs to style via those pseudo elements and classes. And just to add to that too, we're also thinking about the additional states um, that a select could have that will also be standardized. So for example, here, um, the open state, you could change the background color when it's open. Our second proposal um, is something called named slots. Um, and this proposal enables much more powerful customization of controls and content within named slots. And so a set of slot names will correspond to each piece of the controls view that a developer might want to replace with their own content. So in the case of select, we would have slot equals button and slot equals list box. And that will indicate to the platform that custom content is about to be slotted in by the developer. In addition to this, developers would also need to add a part attribute. So part equals button and part equals list, list box um, in the case of select. Um, and I'll go into those parts, the part attribute here briefly in a moment about why that's needed. So if you've ever wanted to add like a country flag or some other visual content into your list box, which again is just the, the drop down or, or the pop up, um, of a select, this, uh, this proposal will allow you to do so without having to rewrite the whole control from scratch. And slots also provide the flexibility to customize only specific parts of a control. So for this example, let's take input type equals range. A developer could provide a slot and a part for the movable thumb 
and the UI for the track would automatically fall back to the default provided by the platform. And just to note here too, with this solution specifically, there is a lot of other work that would need to be done to input um, that would make the solution work. Um, so please check out the explainer for a lot more detail on this, but this is like the goal of these named slots. And so you might be asking, why do I have to provide a part and a slot name? So with parts, platform code will be wired up to identify the elements that are corresponding to required control parts. And it will apply native event handlers where applicable to handle user input. So this will ensure, or this will let developers make UI tweaks without having to rewrite tons of JavaScript to handle input. And it ensures those customized user interfaces can handle all of the input modalities that users expect. So by just adding your part attribute, um, you're letting the platform, you're enabling the platform to do what it was meant to do and apply things for you. And finally, our third solution is shadow DOM replacement. So currently, uh, if you attempt to call, well, you can't call um, attach shadow um, on any form control currently, it throws an exception. And so with our proposal, this restriction will be removed when enabling customization for a given control type. Um, and calling attached shadow will result in the default user agent shadow DOM being swapped out with a new shadow root um, that will be populated with content provided by the developer. So this is for developers who want full control over something, perhaps framework um, authors being able to replace all that. However, developers with this uh, solution will still be required to label the core parts of their shadow DOM using the part attribute. Otherwise, the shadow DOM will not be rendered at all. And so requiring that these part attributes be supplied also ensures that the correct accessibility semantics and that user input, um, those user input event handlers I mentioned previously, get applied by the platform. So this is for accessibility also. The platform will not make an attempt to guess at the correct behavior and won't render an incomplete control implementation. And again, that way, you can just let the platform do what it was supposed to do for you. It will handle those user input event handlers and it will handle accessibility for you so you don't have to add all that back in um, like you currently do now if you're rewriting a control from scratch. I think just adding that part attribute is a small price to pay to let the platform handle all of that for you. And so I just want to give a shout out to all of the authors who worked on this customizing control UI. Again, it was a cross company effort with Microsoft, Google and Salesforce. Um, and if you are interested in further reading this explainer, because there is so much more detail that I was not able to go into today, um, please go check it out. You can find that at aka.ms backslash controls dash explainer. Please go give that a read or go check out the pop-up proposal um, explainer that is also out there. We need you. If you're a developer, we need and we want your feedback and opinions on this work. Um, We've, you know, with form controls and attempting to style them, obviously the current solutions or what's currently out there isn't working. And so we want to ensure that we are building the correct thing and enabling behaviors um, that you expect from your controls. So please, please um, let us know uh, and provide feedback. And there are multiple ways that you can do that. So again, you can contribute to the form control investigations on OpenUI. Um, the URL for that is open-ui.org. Um, tell browser vendors what you need from your form controls. Lots of us are on Twitter. Lots of folks who, who work on browsers are on Twitter if you're on there. We pay attention to those things. Um, so 
let us know or, or open an issue on, on our status page, um, let us know. And then finally, like I've mentioned previously, provide feedback on the explainers. We're putting those out into the public um, for you to consume and read and, and give your feedback on. And then go ahead and follow these folks. Um, this is again on Twitter. So, so Melanie said is the Microsoft Edge PM leading this work. Greg Whitworth is at Salesforce and is leading OpenUI. Stubbornella is Nicole Sullivan, and she's the group, the Chrome PM working on this. And I am C. Otta, Stephanie Stymac. Um, I'm here to support Melanie and, and OpenUI, so you can always tweet me, and I will make sure that, the, that your feedback gets to the right person. Because at the end of the day, we are here to listen, because these improvements are ultimately for you and to make your life as a developer easier. So thank you.